As per American Bar Association last year, one amongst every three aspiring lawyer wants to get into mergers and acquisition. In a report by the Hindu Business Line, corporate law deals in India today in terms of mergers and acquisition amount to $60.54 billion. And last year in India, there were nearly 1147 mergers and acquisition deals. This is perhaps one of the major reasons why most of the law students in India want to venture into mergers and acquisition as a career. But what happens behind the shiny of glass cables is a mystery to many. Today, to solve one of those mysteries, we have with us one of the leading CEOs of the country who is le who's leading uh, online education, legal online education in India, an author of a book and somebody who was known to be the blue eyed ball or boy of one of the corporates, leading legal corporates of India. Abhyoday, welcome to an Arvid Law Seeker. Thanks, Aditya. And thank you, everyone who have come to watch us live and have this conversation. I hope you find right, value okay. in our conversation today. I'm sure they will. Uh, this is one of the most requested subjects that uh, law students today have asked us to do ever since we started an Orbit, Arvid Law Seco. And we are truly right. delighted to have you on the show. Uh, so, Abhide, uh, there are a lot of questions lined up for you today. However, I would like to start by asking you that uh, what goes behind a, a law company when uh, mergers and acquisition deals are considered? So I want to start with what kind of work does an m associate necessarily has to do on an everyday right. basis? Okay, so um, there is widely, uh, people understand the corporate team of a law firm, right? You say you want to work in a corporate law firm, you want to work in corporate law. So the most common practice area is corporate, which in the biggest firms is divided into general corporate and m &A. Okay. Uh, now m and work is when someone, when two companies merge or someone invests in another company or one company buys out another company. Okay. Now this is the most exciting work uh, for corporate lawyers that, uh, that is people who want to work, work on transactions because uh, it can be pretty, uh, detailed complex exciting challenging uh, and even for businessmen it's very exciting because it makes them grow it makes them rich if one company is acquired by another company uh, the, the company which is acquired the entrepreneur has an opportunity of you know getting richer and uh, so this is this is some of the most exciting stuff that people work on now m a transactions actually are a standard M&A transaction is one where uh, there is an acquisition of one company's shares by another individual or company. Okay, and listed company acquisitions are some of the most high-profile uh, transactions that happen. The ones that get reported uh, and the ones people want to work on. Some of the top law firms in the country, the top four or five law firms, would be working most on the listed M&As. However, most of the corporate law firms do work on M&As, but it may not be listed company M&As. It might be private company acquisitions, like uh, acquisition of shares in either a private company or in an unlisted public company. So these are not listed. Now, the difference between a listed and a non-listed M&A is that when you are acquiring a listed company, uh, then the takeover code becomes applicable in India. And there are insider trading regulations which need to be complied with. And uh, you need to, and due diligence for a listed company acquisition is different because you will only look at what is publicly available and perform a due diligence based on that. Any insider information, any other information which you usually seek from a private company, when you acquire a private company, that information cannot be acquired because it will amount to insider information. And since the acquisition is a share purchase transaction, it will. Uh, lead to insider trading. So that kind of diligence cannot happen. In private company acquisitions, on the other hand, there is, a, there is, you will actually take a lot of information from the promoters uh, and you will do a full fledged diligence on the company. There's a whole information seeking exercise. There are uh, diligence, there can be a virtual diligence platform uh, where this diligence is done. Okay. In big transactions, especially with foreign law firms, or in like the top M&A deals, you will have a virtual due diligence room. Otherwise, companies can share their documents over a normal email or a Dropbox folder. Now, 
there are different kinds of uh, even private company m and a's are, diff are can be of various kinds like the simplest is just a pure investment transaction you don't call it an uh, you don't call it an acquisition now i am explaining this so that you understand the commercial perspective from which the transaction happens inside a law firm it may not be that people see these distinctions because to get whether it's an investment transaction or an acquisition transaction or a buyout transaction these are all parts of m and a but if I, I all of these will be executed through a shareholders agreement even a joint venture transaction will be executed through a shareholders agreement so at the center of it all the same legal documents are there but the point is that because their intention is different there may be some difference in the clauses of each of these shareholder agreements the negotiations may happen differently and the kind of advice you give you know at a subtle level it changes when you are speaking with your client or the other side or when you are advising on the negotiation so while you might so as lawyers you know what happens we want to read uh, the law and we understand as once we understand all the provisions of the law we feel very glad that ha huh, we know crpc we know ipc now now we're good with everything but it doesn't happen like that because it's the same sha and now depending on the nature of the transaction you will change the wording of the clauses so that things to be kept in mind now in within private company acquisitions there can be a share acquisition uh, the most common one is a share acquisition now these could be investment transactions where a certain amount of money is being invested by an investor if it's more than uh, like takeover code has a threshold of 20 25% right if there's more than 25% then there's an open offer to be made but uh, i would say that so there is an investment transaction and if you are acquiring more than a certain amount or if you are acquiring control you call it an acquisition transaction share acquisitions are the most common ones now one of the things we miss out when in college we want to learn about mna is that we jump straight to the companies act provisions of mergers and we realize that and we we want to learn the we want to master that provision now the trick here is that that is the is one of the lesser used provisions for mna teams mna is much lesser about mergers than it is about share acquisitions in india okay so in us you have contractual mergers which don't require court approval but in india because court approval is required and creditors have a chance to object uh, only companies which are related to each other which are in the same corporate group they undertake this route of going to court for a merger the remaining transactions are share purchases okay or share acquisitions you can also have uh, a business transfer where the entire undertaking of the company is transferred to another entity in which case the business is taken on the basis of its net worth and the shares are not acquired now this also happens in the mna practice while it's not called strictly an mna transaction you the third uh, way could be an asset purchase where specific assets of one company are purchased by another company this has happened a lot asset purchases have happened a lot in the uh, telecom tower business where uh, one company would acquire the towers or the passive infrastructure of another company so this is a broad idea of the kind of transactions you will be working on when you are in an mna team now one more thing you have to look at is that when there is a foreign investor involved in these acquisitions then there is a fema angle and so you will look at foreign investment regulations and uh, yeah uh and you will also look at structuring of the transaction from a tax perspective many corporate law firms do not look at that or they or the tax advisors separately look at that because tax so it could come from a tax law firm or it could come from one of the big four ca firms which often happens when a transaction is structured okay and sometimes like if you have a us group uh, which is undertaking a merger or a restructuring exercise in india restructuring would also mean maybe they're selling off a business division from one company to another so the operations are structured in such a way from the beginning uh, at the parent company's level which may be outside india which may be from say the us that there are only x or y amount of ways in which you can undertake that transaction and it will be obvious which is a tax uh, which is an efficient tax structure because a master level structuring would have already happened when the group first entered into india because they have been operating in us and other continents let's say where they have already planned their tax structuring so you already inherit a certain kind of tax structure and then you have to work on actually optimizing that tax structure but tax work is not done by the corporate and m and a team it's usually done by the tax team or a big work cfo okay
so that was a perspective of the kind of transactions you deal with when you are actually working in the mna team on, of a law firm all right abhi the so abhi the and, and a, uh, lot of, a lot of people working in the general corporate team end up working on investment transactions which are very very similar all right yeah. abhi so these are the kind of transactions transactions that uh, the lawyers on a day to day basis will have to deal with what is the job role of a lawyer by performing that these these kind of transactions right so one of the biggest uh, so this is for junior lawyers whom do you want to ask yeah, for the fresher okay. the fresher associate so one of the biggest tasks of a fresher is to start with due diligence okay and due diligence means that when an investor or an acquirer is acquiring another company you need to identify whether the company has been operating in compliance with all applicable laws and whether the transaction whether the contract that they propose to enter into for the investment whether that is consistent to their current status of operation so you will check with check their compliance with the companies act you will check whether they are validly constituted whether they have made required filings i'm talking about the legal due diligence i'll clarify here not the business due diligence not the financial due diligence which are not undertaken by lawyers so the work of a junior lawyer is to actually work on this due diligence now the pain here is that a lot of junior lawyers feel that this is boring work now definitely it can be templatized and it is rec recurring and repetitive work which tends to give it that nature but what problem junior lawyers face is that they do not they are not able to comprehend the uniqueness of the transaction which is being undertaken because of which this occurs to them as repetitive work but they are unable to actually put in their own creativity and intellect in getting this done and that can be on many fronts it can be in identification of what are the aspects to cover when they undertake due diligence so they might have to re review for example hundreds of contracts now if a company has 100 offices you will end up reviewing 100 lease agreements now it becomes difficult then to identify what is the information to be recorded and while doing it you will feel that why am i just putting in data here okay but it matters on how you plan the work what details you capture how you draw inferences and you might have the assistance of interns and how you so how you delegate the work to them that can make a difference in how effective you are now and it is mistakenly believed that only as a junior lawyer you will be doing due diligence because ultimately the due diligence report goes out signed by the partner so even the partner is involved in at least reviewing the due diligence reviewing your observations and findings so while you have the bulk of the role in the due diligence your senior associate will be available for guidance your partner will be involved too while they won't do the work with you if you have any doubts you can always ask them so reviewing documents is one thing okay so you could review contracts you could review uh you could review their filings searching on public databases like a mca search is always done to find out what are the filings these are not undertaken by company secretaries but by lawyers so mca search is done or if if the secretary has taken it company secretary has undertaken the search and all the filings are dug out by lawyers to understand that this is everything is going on fine the books of the company or whether the registers are correctly maintained then you have to identify all the applicable laws to that sector of the company and in that creativity is required a lot of times this is prepared by junior lawyers together with senior lawyers senior associates who have uh, who will be figuring out what are the applicable systems or applicable laws and regulations and most of the times unless you worked on that sector before every time you do a due diligence on a company you will have to freshly find out the relevant area of law applicable to that company that can be pretty exciting because the way you frame your it's called a due diligence requisition list this is the first thing you do when you first request documents from a company so the way you frame your due diligence requisition list is going to determine what kind of documents are forwarded to you and that's going to sort of strategize the way you conduct your due diligence so that is there so due diligence is one of the parts preparation of the due diligence report where you draft what is to be done what are the findings and what are the action points that are required so action point so findings is an inference so there will be data presentation and you will infer something from that data and then you will recommend something on how to rectify any fault or flaw that is there so all these are very uh, important exercises where you learn how to be creative in your presentation how to be how to write in a simple way and how to give uh, doable recommendations like recommendations which can actually 
be used by the company to fix the issue rather than giving unrealistic explanations and in law school we are used to studying provisions with acha what is the fine what is the amount of jail i can go i can get it's not like that here you got to sort things out so you have to always look at how this can be fixed a lot of times law has a compounding procedure and that needs to be known so it gets into the operational details and in law school we look at only the substantive sections where which explain a concept and then we go through case law to understand the width of the concept but here this gets very this gets down to the details like which officer do i need to go to which format do i need to apply in to actually get my offense compounded let's say if there's a regulatory offense so in that way a due diligence is actually a learning exercise for learning the entire breadth of laws applicable to a business operating in a particular sector okay and you may be involved in meetings with the client and negotiations where the work of a junior lawyer is primarily to take down notes and uh, while it lo looks very simple it is not because you will realize that there is so much happening over there that you will end up taking notes and the next day you will not remember what uh, what you mean by the notes you took so unless you are extremely organized and clear and put down everything that you hear there in a structured way in a way that you will understand um it won't be easy so this also note taking takes some practice because notes can include information like remind this one to do that check with your senior associate whether this was done go online and check whether this filing is there so there's a whole web of things that you have to actually remember so these need to be neatly presented for your own self for you to be able to understand your notes uh you may be involved in uh negotiations where your role will be mostly to observe the negotiation and take down the notes okay and uh, of course if they allow you to if you find it appropriate to intervene or suggest things you can recommend but arguing is not something that is recommended for a junior associate you know if you have a doubt you need you have a you're disturbed or something or you think something should be raised you should talk to your senior uh so now after this exercise uh at the stage of drafting of the transaction documents once again you can be involved uh where you take up from you take up a template and you start drafting now uh, initially maybe in the first 6 months you may not draft from scratch but if you're doing well in the law firm after 6 months they will start giving you to prepare the first drafts and then there's a whole round of iterations that keeps happening so someone will say they want a certain clause modified so that that work will also be there and you will find a lot of times you'll find yourself confused because there are so many transactions going on and which point was to be written in which transaction which sha you might forget so that way it's an interesting exercise to keep track of multiple things that are open at the same time and these transactions can take time to close um it will not get closed in five in one week or something it may take a longer period of time and uh, there will be overlapping transactions many transactions fall through which means that you've done all the due diligence and then you realize the transaction didn't go through sometimes in the middle of the due diligence you may be asked to stop doing the diligence because the transaction fell through so that is also a side of this and you will enjoy this kind of work if you are clear about what the overall transaction is about now most of the people don't do that they want to just get done with their work because the work is boring well the work the firm wants you to do looks boring to you but if you actually take up the additional responsibility of identifying what this work is about you will end up learning while that will not benefit the firm right now it will improve your performance in the work you are doing right now and it will enhance your career prospects for the future yeah right over there uh, so over there uh, in, in this varied uh, amount of work that is there uh, while i was interning with uh, lutheran company and when due diligence uh, was going on i was also checked the licenses of around 53 company wow uh, for 53 uh, 53 statute now uh, i realize that uh, mnas are much more about just com fundamental company law there, there are other laws involved as well right so what are these laws that uh, law students should focus on in order to get a hold of uh, uh, mna deals right from the first uh, time that they get into a company or a law firm so the laws applicable to every company can differ widely and there are some common sets of laws that will be applicable for example uh, labor laws will be applicable to every company like provident fund act uh, will be applicable to every company which has more than a certain number of people 10 or 20 factories act to a company which has a factory which means where there is a manufacturing process going on uh, and shops and establishment act to everything that's not a factory 
now this is like the framework for the office part of it similarly there are tax related legislations that you need to know uh, other than labor so in labor there are the three major ones there is provident fund there is uh, gratuity and uh, there is one more which i can't remember so there are those three major ones other than that there may be many special labor laws applicable now the thing is that what you need to know is when which law applies and whether a registration has been obtained so it's great to be familiar with only this part at least of the labor law that when does which law apply and what is the uh, what kind of establishments it applies to so that when you identify okay this company does it have factories okay then this these laws will apply does it have its offices okay then shops and commercial establishments act will apply uh, does it have uh, these many employees okay then epf will apply uh, like that but there are certain sectoral laws like if you suddenly start doing a due diligence on a telecom company you will have to look at the tri act probably all over again for whether the requisite license was there tri might change its or alter its licensing scheme so if you studied something you will have to study again so if you're curious as an enthusiast it helps to keep learning all this and we so like when we did when we created the diploma course in entrepreneurship administration and business laws one of the challenges was to identify the different systems of law that are applicable to a company and one of the simplest things how does that benefit you the simplest way it benefits you in is that you will be extremely effective when you're doing a due diligence because otherwise what happens is that one ends up being lost imagine you have to like you said no uh, aditya that you wanted to you had to review 53 con uh, laws compliance with 53 laws so you couldn't all of a sudden and you might have gotten like 24 or 48 or 72 hours now in that much time you can't sit and figure out which sections apply read the entire law and identify which situations are uh, applicable here if you had even a little bit of heads up it would have made a difference now uh, that is one thing to know from before uh, what else did you say which other laws right yeah um so these this was a set of labor laws then there can be tax related legislation then which includes even stuff like profession tax that is something that most people miss out profession tax is not gst it's not income tax it is that anyone who works in an office or who who does anything uh, as an even even employees a lot of the states have that that people who are working as employees they need to pay a profession tax it can be a very small amount say 400 rupees every year so that kind of so you need to find that out in the in the state for which you are doing the due diligence of that company so this is a general set of laws but many more sectoral laws may be applicable then you need to review the material contracts of the company uh, which is a separate exercise so it's not a legal compliance it's about what are the clauses for termination and uh, what are the clauses that create risk for the company's business model so they will provide you material contracts to do that now this gets complicated when you're doing this for a conglomerate or a company which is very big because then the volume of information that you have to deal with is difficult and how to present information is also difficult now our eyes light up when we see that oh this is a big flaw the lease agreement has expired and the lease is not renewed and we want to point that out first thing in the due diligence report that we found some some action point right but we need to be a little wiser about it and collect all the information first and then just obtain at least a confirmation from the management that was this renewed do you know that this is expired so before we put things in a finalized due diligence report and how to present the information remains to be a continues to be a challenge because you have 53 laws to comply with how do you make that uh readable for someone who's a manager how do you make um how do you make the status of 50 leases for example readable for a manager so those things are, are where creativity is required now how do you prepare these laws i think one of the biggest hacks is to use like the labor law manual or uh, ip law manual intellectual property laws manual because they will have all the bare acts inside them i prefer to use these manuals as opposed to the online copies because they may not be updated apart from the income tax and the sebi websites and uh, dipp website a lot of for a lot of these acts the standard acts which are there it's best to use updated hard copies so that you can read it and you can it helps to read it again and again like because it will not strike you on your first reading as to what is important and what is not so maybe you've gone through 10 acts at once and then one day you read some article in a newspaper and something strikes you that which act will be applicable and then you'll realize what are the filters to use when you're reading a particular statute so if you do that over a period of time 
then you will actually start registering it and build a certain kind of capacity to do this. So this is one of the ways. And of course, taking these online courses makes a huge difference because there, there is some of the hard work has been strategically like bridged for you and you can learn things in a easier way. And it's not like you're getting everything on a spoon. You still have tons of work to do on your own, but you just get a good head start over things. Things that would otherwise uh, take you. Kasha, Sorry? That answers your question. Uh, Mrigna Kashyap has the same question as to how helpful are online courses uh, okay. to get into an m &E team. So I hope that Mrigna answers your question. Uh, I didn't. I can yeah. answer it in further detail if. Yes, we will definitely come to that question Fine. later. How when we are discussing uh, about uh, how okay. to get into an m &E team. Okay. Yes. Uh, so Abhide, uh, one of the biggest challenges that a person feels while performing a due diligence is when they're dealing with the local laws. Because right. generally in a, comp in, a, in a law firm, the library does not necessarily has the local laws. And uh, if you look them online on their website, uh, they're generally in the uh, regional language of that particular state. Right, right. Uh, how do you deal with that situation when uh, you're doing an M&A? So if your law firm has an office in the state or in the region where, uh, where the diligence is happening. So say you're in a Delhi office of a firm, it has a Bangalore office and you are actually uh, performing a diligence for in an in a location in Karnataka. So then it might be still easier because <clears throat> your firm can procure a local copy of the book and then you'll have to call the associate or someone who's willing to help over there uh, to scan the relevant pages or courier the book to you. And these are the old fashioned methods. And if your firm doesn't have an office even there, then it becomes a challenge. Karnataka, ka, how do you get a Karnataka book in Delhi? So I don't have I don't know the answer as to what people are using now. But there are some laws such as uh, stamp duty, for example. So there are stamp duty laws are there in all states. And what's uh, more complicated is that every state has issued an exemption on certain kinds of transactions for stamp duty. And those notifications are not available anywhere online. So, but luckily there are a couple of books, Krishna Murthy and there's another publisher, uh, another author who has a book on this stamp duty. So you can view all the state acts uh, and the state exemptions together in one book. The only thing is that it will only be available there in that book. It will not be available outside. So if outside of that something has been passed, by chance it's been missed, there is nothing you can do about it. You won't even know. Uh, okay. So Abhide, uh, we, we spoke a lot about due diligence and we did speak a lot about the transactions that take place. Uh, from a lawyer's perspective, what is the standard process of due diligence? Uh, as an associate who joins a company, what all, uh, so like you said that you have to attend the meetings, uh, figure it out and then go ahead, uh, get the documents ready, uh, research all of that. So uh, from a lawyer's perspective and a fresher's perspective, uh, what, what is a standard procedure of performing a due diligence? So the first uh, step is that a requisition list is prepared, which is sent to the people who are coordinating from the company side. So see, you will be acting from the investors in all likelihood investors or acquirers perspective, because that's the person who's going to do the due diligence. And you may be, uh, yeah, so you may, you will, your client is the investor, but you are actually doing the diligence on the company and the company has no, and you'll be dealing with the company staff and they have no kind of, they are not obliged to speak, to listen to your orders. So one has to be very kind and, uh, and professional while and clear while speaking with them, while dealing with the company. The first step is because I'm saying this because there is a lot of back and forth communication that happens between the uh, lawyers and the investee or the target company. Okay. Now the first step is to prepare a requisition list where you actually figure out what are the documents that you need from the company and for which you need to do your own research to identify what are the different kinds of laws that are applicable to that sector and to that company. And you have to word your requisition list in a way that it enables things you don't specifically know, but it enables those things to be pointed out by the company's management. So you will say that any material contracts of X, Y, Z types and other types like that, not, you will not go and pinpoint every little contract, right? You may say all applicable registrations pertaining to conduct of telecom business, applicable registrations for the, uh, for the offices that are there, something like that. So there are, and these requisition lists, we cover them in the diligence, due diligence course. These are divided into uh, headings for the different parts. Like there will be consents and approvals. There will be corporate company registers. There will be material contracts, uh, employment agreements and ESOP plans like that. So there's a whole set 
and that can be expanded or reduced depending on the history of the company or nature of its business if you are acquiring a parent and it has subsidiaries then you will want to know a lot more information about the subsidiaries of the parent also so then that list expands and you start with uh, knowing you start with a precedent of a requisition list for a past similar tra past transaction which was similar and then you conduct your own research and improve that requisition list a lot of times people search in the within the firm for whether others in the firm have done a similar transaction for on in that sector so that they can get a quick brief of which are the laws that are applicable so this is the first stage now i am not distinguishing whether it's a first year associate or a senior associate who does this and i think the hungrier you are the faster you get about these things you do it one of the problems i faced was that i used to jump at the smallest thing i found but i used to not end up doing the work properly or completely and that was an initial problem area i used to be excited about knowing and understanding and getting the work really fast and pointing out something rather than completing the work for which i had a lot more time on my hands so you you need to ensure that you do complete uh, work when you are given this in a law firm so what happened with me uh, so yeah first is the requisition list and then um, you start getting the documents from the client uh, they may be shared over email or in a folder or in a virtual diligence room then you will need to again match whether all the documents are shared or not and if there are any documents missing so once that is complete then you actually get to review of the documents and as you review you can start writing the report or you can wait to because you'll not just need to start making your second level notes you might start to draw a table of the applicable lease agreements you might start to write some draft observations as you review the document it's very important not to think that someone else is going to finalize a transaction or the report it's best to think that how would i review this if the company was my own how would i review this if i was putting my own money into this company how would i review this if i am the partner who's sending out this report okay these three perspectives are very important to include while you are working otherwise you will end up working like a peon and you will get blasted for it and you will hate your experience and then you will hate corporate law firm and you will hate corporate law okay and uh, so that's the diligence part now in the diligence part i said what you have to do after matching the documents you start reviewing identifying what are the things that are missing whether the company got a show cause notice which it didn't reply to whether there's a pending uh, fine which has not been paid by it whether uh, whether they are violating a law and they are not aware of it they've not done anything to address it whether lease agreement has expired whether factory's license has ex expired are there laborers who find there's a litigation section also so you will there you will see what are the pending cases that have been filed and what is the claim what is the relief that is being claimed so that you can estimate the maximum amount of liability of the company what is the stage that the case is at if there is an adverse decision of the court then is there an appeal that has been filed so these kind of things will be reviewed and uh, a lot of times you know despite getting the documents you will have to rely on communications with the company and there will be certain people so you will keep doing email communication you will ask okay was this renewed was this thing fixed so there will be certain set of people who will authorize who will be authorized to communicate with you for all these clarifications they will be called the management representatives and uh, these people so whatever you conversation you have and whatever outcomes you obtain after speaking to them those conversations will be written about like you will say that the license has expired but management representatives have told us that a new an application for renewal has been filed we don't we were not provided a copy of the renewal application this you will say only if you were actually not provided the copy after having asked so that kind of thing has to be written so so there's a lot of communication skills understanding interpretation think uh, you have to think of what is appropriate to suggest because if you start uh, scaring your client who's the investor by just saying that there are so many non compliances he is probably not going to trust you as a lawyer he is going to be interested in how you fix the business and this is something we miss as business lawyers because we want to look at what is right in law what is wrong in law that is the first filter that we use from first day of law school till the end of law school and our moot court uh, competitions are all about that right right in law wrong in law punishable not punishable violation of principle not violation of principle and a businessman is going to say hey buddy how do i go ahead with this just tell me that so your direction and your radar is going to be like that that how does this get fixed you will automatically think everything is a violation you can't like the, every violation there is a valid violation has to be acknowledged and it needs to be looked at from the point of 
how can this be sorted so that business as usual continues and uh, so that's the that's the recording of notes part then you prepare your diligence report you show it to your senior associate there will be a couple of rounds of that and there may be other associates with you who will be doing the who will be working on different sections of the due diligence report because one person alone can't do everything you may have some interns to help you so you can practice your delegation skills with them because sometimes if you delegate smartly you might be able to get a lot more out of them than otherwise okay and that will really ease your work out and delegation is really an art in these things so once you learn the work it's a great idea to delegate effectively and optimize your your output and then uh, the diligence report is prepared uh, sometimes your partner will give you some inputs so you can incorporate them and ultimately it's sent out to the client after that the transaction documentation may be reviewed again so so, so it depends right a, a lot of times that the investment transaction is executed and but the money is not paid the money will be paid when the due diligence exercise is satisfactorily completed sometimes there might be a due diligence which is commenced and you don't have a full fledged agreement you have a very broad general agreement or you just have a term sheet and you want to uh, complete the due diligence and after which there is an execution of transaction documents in that case there will be more drafting work and all of that that you will go through Okay. okay. So Abhiray, an internal source has told us that you were one of the most promising lawyers of your company. Uh, but however, you mean of the law firm I worked in? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but however, uh, like just you mentioned that you did face certain challenges. What was yeah. the biggest challenge that you faced uh, in the law firm that you were working, or personally as a lawyer? There were several challenges. One I already told you about. I used to jump up when I found something. and that didn't work because i thought that if i find the answer the fastest that makes sense that's how our school and our colleges are designed right that's how quiz competitions work find the answer first but this is not that this is that you do have a certain amount of time to get something done you have to get to work the output you produce needs to be of a good quality and one thing we all i expected was that you know google docs used to work back then as well so i was expecting that you know as and when i'm going about it i can expect some cooperation or you know clarity i can expect clarifications from time to time uh, or whenever i have a doubt it will get clarified i can ask but that doesn't happen you have to take your call and decisions on how to do something even though you've never done it before and that's the beginning of your learning people don't point it out as that and if you just ask too much they'll say it's and we're not available do whatever you can you will end up doing a bad job of it then you'll get blasted then you'll feel that when i went earlier why didn't my senior tell me what to do but that's not going to help because it's your job to get it right or to get it do it well even if you don't know it okay you have to and it's very uh, it's not like something that requires special coaching it's just something which you have to understand from what what a reader will appreciate will a non lawyer but someone who can read english will he be able to understand what you're writing that kind of thing so so you need to do your work on your own right and cha other challenges are that when there are when the transactions are big you will not remember what the hell is happening one time i worked on a transaction where there were multiple investee companies involved and the investor had subscribed to shares in each of the investee companies and he was getting a different kind of uh, share in each company in, in something it was an optionally convertible debenture in another company it was a compulsorily convertible debenture there was some violation in some company and wasn't there in other companies it was really confusing any time a question was asked i had i would have had to go back to my notes right so now in these cases having a ready set of notes which you can refer to whenever there's a confusion helps a lot so usually i have a very good desk at a law firm right so many associates put up their post its with these notes or they'll take a print out of a transaction structure so that that is very clear in front of them otherwise you will feel that you are having a memory loss problem all right So there, uh, other thing, yeah, he... one more thing. I there are a couple of other problems. One is you might not know what the work is. Like a senior delegates something to you, and he might ask you to navigate a small question. By the time you've done that, you realize that the senior has realized that the question is something else. Okay, so that turns out to be a huge problem. Uh, what's best in that case is, as far as possible, try to ask, uh, try to ask your senior to share a real copy of the mail that the client has asked. so that you and he can work together as you know, collaboratively 
okay and then delegating the work turns out to be a challenge because if you're not delegated the right part of the work you will end up looking in all the directions you're not supposed to go it so you need to know what exactly your work is rather than just doing something and a lot of times you can go under the radar and you can spend your time just doing something which is only a fringe aspect and you don't know how else it's going to pan out sometimes you realize you spent all your time doing something which was not required to be done even though you were asked to do that because of this communication gap so it's very important that you keep obtaining that clarity from time to time and you will find that some people are easier to work with on that front some people are not but you got to make it work with everyone and also i think it makes sense to be honest about how much work you can handle and if you want if you prefer a different style of working a lot of people are scared in asking their seniors about you know can we work like this can you do this why did you do this is there another way possible i have not seen juniors do that i used to do a little bit of it not as much as i would have liked to but still a little yeah aditya you can tell me if something is addressed i am i know i'm speaking fast and i have a lot to say but if you think that uh, i need to cut the answer you can tell me to wrap that up no no absolutely not abhita because i think these are some of the insights that people should know about before making sure. a career choice sure. because right now uh, most of the people like me even when i was in my law school i considered going for mergers and acquisitions steam without knowing what goes behind it so i think right. once we are able to cover that we can talk about uh, how to get into it once everybody is clear of the aspect of what goes behind the making and i think i think we have pretty much covered that part and i think this is a time to move to the next set of questions sure. as to how to go about it so my very first question is that uh, how was you and this is something that is off the record but we would really like to know how was your life in a law school and how did you prepare yourself to get into the mna team of a corporate so life in law school spent 5 years and work for getting into corporate law spent 2 years it should have spent a little lesser but because i was applying for foreign law firms also it was fourth year and fifth year were literally spent in that and uh, there were no structured methods for preparation back then today you have so many online courses that are available for specific aspects of what you want to learn so all you need to know is what do i need to learn and how it will help me back then i was just going nuts asking people and i i got shortlisted for three foreign law firm interviews some of the best foreign law firms in the country because i had a string of good internships and i had a good rank and i had participated in in mooting and i had published some articles so all of that was like the standard ideal cv i had but then when i went to speak to people for how to prepare for interviews um there were a number of problems so what happened was um i sp- i spoke to everyone who had succeeded in a foreign law firm interview so i had done the de- research the research speaking and then i had even done a lot of mock interviews the problem is that for the hr type questions that come the general personality type questions people tend to prepare very uh flat answers which are not unique to them which don't express anything and which look like they are prepared and learned so they are not spontaneous at all they don't actually act they're not in communication really with the interviewer but they are just having their own mental tape recorder played out so that becomes a problem when you do these mock interviews so you need to really understand what is imp- what is important to learn there second thing is that people said things like uh, common sense is what works they say it's very simple practical stuff they say go read pink newspapers and i did all of that and still it didn't work out so and which is when i realized that systematic training is important here and the reason things didn't work out also was because i was uh, i was very self conscious during interviews and uh, that also was there while i was uh, while i was doing some of the assessment exercises that the firms have so assessment exercises that time you could never be sure whether you you know how to go about it because you'd never seen a business transaction from point a to point b you would not know how they think now to simply say that this is a matter of co- common sense or a uh, commercial skill which anyone can have i don't i don't agree with that i think that uh, it requires an understanding of what a business does and how it functions and what are the interests of a businessman and a lawyer then you can develop your intuition and skills to work in that manner but when you don't even know that all you know is that these are the deals that happen these are the things that constrict that create troubles and it's all very unstructured so that's what happened for me i read a lot of books i had read a lot of business books which made me very excited about corporate law but i could not uh, apply all those concepts in india in the context in india or 
to a normal vanilla business transaction because i read something that was you know celebrated made a big issue out of you read a business book you read all of that but you can't study and understand how that applies in an everyday transaction so then that knowledge again wasn't helpful so with indian law firms however my interviews were a lot better because they cared about how much you know about the law which is practical which is directly applicable lesser about contracts and commercial sense but more direct about the applicable law how to register how to file something how to address some issue so i was much more comfortable with that and i ended up succeeding in a lot in the all the indian law firm interviews that i gave yeah so all right abhi so you yeah. come from uh, national university of juridical sciences and you chose kolkata which is one of the top national law universities in the country and thus the common perception goes that for you to get a job on the day zero could have been probably easier however <laughs> i have kunal and uh, akriti raj's question which says that uh, that they have heard that big law, legal firms specializing in m and a sector hire fresh graduates from the top rated nlus only what can right. a non nlu student try to end up in, at m and a department at a top law firm so it might not be the best idea to only want to work in a top m and a law firm first of all to start with it's not necessarily true that you have to work in a top 5 law firm to take your career off to a flying start but uh, what is important is if you're not so national law schools have their established placement cells certain relationships with law firms so a lot of times law firms will only visit them when they want to hire in big numbers but they keep making that occasional hire they, there are always exceptions to this rule and what you need to figure out is a method or a system that makes you that exception so there are certain methods that work for that one is that getting your skills really high up and then being known for that so you might need to publish uh, a few articles online so that people can know about you when you write your email uh, when you write your internship or job applications your email suddenly stands out and even if it's one amongst hundreds of them the person who's reading it wants to open this uh then building your own network uh so that you can so that you know people who can tell you that hey listen i can say i can recommend you in this place because and recommendation doesn't mean a push or a favor it just means i can inform you of this opening here i'll not put in a word you apply here that's it and when people informally ask me i'll say ha this person has worked for me and this person does good job that is all that you need in a recommendation you need nothing more so this much lo- to to have this much of logistics working for you say if you know 50 people who work in law firms or you know 20 people who work in law firms imagine the kind of access you will have to law firm jobs it will be tremendous okay so that kind of network needs to be built and for which you need to have your online profile and linkedin all of that optimized now i've seen a lot of law students today they're still not on linkedin and some students have privacy issues so they're not on facebook and not on linkedin at all but i think linkedin is a must for any any if you are interested in developing your career linkedin is a must okay so that you can network with people and you need to have your articles published in a variety of websites or even if it's there available online on one or two websites that's fine you can have it on say blog.ipreaders.it now the other thing is that you need to intern in an off season ideally when they are not crowded with a bunch of interns and when associates actually have the time and bandwidth to notice you and to overload you with work so that is something you need to figure out if your college is in a city uh, where say like bombay students from glc can easily intern in a law firm after their college so that offers a certain kind of advantage many colleges don't offer that because they are not in a sit uh, they are not located in a mainstream city where the corporate law firms are or the college itself has a very high attendance requirement so there is no laxity available now this is an advantage that ca students have that they can actually start interning and intern for long years so when they come out to practice they have a lot of skills but as law students we don't have that so you need to find out that which are the firms you can intern in during an off season and you need to intern for longer than one month because one month is the basic time it takes anyone to learn try two months try three or six months if you do repeat internships it indicates a very high level of interest of yours in the firm and that always or uh, that will always benefit you in comparison to say what national law school students have they have to go by one formula they have to succeed at an interview at a campus placement and maybe they would have had to do an internship the method for you on the other hand will be very different so you have to not bother about this and look at the way that will make you succeed and the key 
elements required to make you the exception to the rule i have just shared i think i think there are some of the great uh, bunch of advices for everybody who's watching us right now uh, anu uh, akriti and uh, hardik hope that answers your question we have another question uh, from anusha who is working with an mna team at a law firm she's interning right now and she wants to know what kind of work to expect as an intern and given the fact that you spoke about delegation uh, of work right. right now as an associate so right. what kind of work can an intern expect to make a good impression so if she's already interning she might be getting some work what is advisable is for her to take more and more work take as much a little more than she can immediately handle so that she's stretched uh that is one second you will you are likely to get list making work okay so you are going to be looking at uh let's say a new world from a very narrow lens so what you need to do is keep asking questions to your seniors when they are free to give you a little bigger brief about the commercial intentions of clients maybe share a past transaction document with you or uh, share the email of the client with you now that's a practice that differs from law firm to law firm some law firms will not give interns any access to email and other law firms are very open so they will give you access to emails on their system so so that actually if you can see a client email it makes a big difference if you can get a past template that makes a big difference now other than the time you spend working on the work you've been given you need to spend time trying to understand what the hell is happening out there for that you need to actually be read uh, read a little more ask these questions to understand okay what is the transaction about who are the parties what do they want what would make what would maximize the value for them a lot of times these interests are competing so you need to understand like in an m&a team who's the acquirer which sec company is he acquiring how much is he paying a lot of commercials are always wiped out by dashes in the agreement so what happens then the whole value of the deal goes away right now if if an investor is investing 100 crores in a company or if an acquirer is acquiring a company for i don't know 500 crores you want to know that and you want to understand okay share me how much is he paying for each share how much is the face value of the share what is the difference so these are the commercials of the business now this is invariably very exciting if you learn these things it it will actually enable you to think from different ways in and forward the deal and forward your work otherwise you will feel like someone who was just given you know a uh, list making work and you will be like i am bored to death so but, but the thing is that your seniors may not be directly feeding your need to know more so you will have to reach out to them and also not be a pest with that so you will have to identify the right kind of opportunities like a lunch break and don't pester the same associate every lunch break but you can meet Uh, an associate who ends up like who seems to be like your mentor, so you can do that once in every lunch, every alternate day or every two three days uh, in a break. Smoke breaks are a good time to accompany an associate and ask questions. Uh, sometimes if they are busy, please give them their space. So that is that. And one more thing I think is that you have a lot of access to documents when you are inside a law firm for reading and study purposes. Okay, so. those are some things you should read and learn and understand so you might want to compare documents from one transaction with those of another transaction aditya is this working i am you frozen yes yes uh, I'm, i can I'm see you actually okay. the problem is uh, here with uh, my connection fine, so fine. i can see you and you can please carry on okay yeah so the other thing is that you might so you should take out time to study these documents and understand what they mean and you might also be given some work like proofreading documents and uh some work about editing definitions clauses and things like that now that work is again mistaken to be clerical work but it is very important you can only so it's called like sanitizing a document or referencing a document or proofreading a document these things will you will be effective at this only when you start understanding the document so don't think of it as an exercise where you just edit commas and full stops you need to really understand the whole mechanics of a document and who knows maybe you realize after going through this that a critical clause is missing and imagine if you go and point that out to your senior they will be pleased that by god you actually had the ability to identify that one major clause like a breach clause or a consequences of breach clause anything maybe something critical was missing and and that can just ensure lift your reputation and image up in their eyes and you will get uh you may be likely to get a job they'll break all rules to get you that kind of a job because you've been you've shown that spark 
you've shown results actually not just the spark yeah all right great uh abhinay amit asthana has a question he has been practicing at uh, criminal and constitutional law but now he wants to make a switch to a corporate firm he wants to know his options because of interest in studying and working on corporate side especially mna so he wants to know how to do this you mean he 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 wants to know how to take that switch uh from a uh, the constitution and criminal aspect to mnas um so there are multiple ways one is that first you will need to build some skill sets on this front right so you will need to probably take up an online course uh and once you've built up some expertise in this area it is likely that some of your criminal law clients so you'll find people who want to give you drafting work you can even if you charge lesser money you can take that up to learn and practice your skills and uh, because every kind of drafting is not super complex so you can practice that kind of work when you are a little thorough with that that's the time to start apply uh, start speaking to identifying openings in law firms and use your networks to apply these openings share about what skill sets you have and what skill sets you are acquiring uh, so you know we tend to think of every recruitment process like being to be like a civil services examination that you apply for it and if you are talented you will get a job it's not like that here this is the private sector you need to identify on your own where there are opportunities different people have networks of different sizes make your network big so that you come to know and you share with people that you're looking for a job in the corporate sector if you know a job is available so that they can actually let you know if a job is available and then you apply and when you are applying you basically have this experience of having uh, done such some kind of work so that you can explain uh, in an interview what you know and uh, you should have you should have also as i had said for law, freshers also you should have a set of online publications so that when people dig you up they find that you know you've done some specific work and your online publication should be specific problem solving oriented right if you even if you're a criminal lawyer there'll be a lot of work around white collar crime which is which interfaces with criminal law and uh, sort of commercial or corporate law so you can even write about that and write in a practical way like what would say save directors of liability on a particular angle or what are the what are the things that should be ensured by directors when the police is undertaking an investigation in their company premises so i'm giving you example so now if you see how this topic is this is very different from writing on powers duties of directors under companies act which is a very regular topic and it's a it will be a copy paste of the companies act sections so that won't work okay so you need to identify these areas and have your own body of work online and that makes it easier for you to express that you are actually ready for the job you are applying for all right abhi there abhi there uh, we are left with two more minutes and we have a very quick question for you uh, right. as you're working with online education for the past 7 years this is a question from brigna and hardik how helpful are the online courses in getting a job at an mnat so we've known of uh, a lot of students from our diploma course uh that's the longest it's been there for 6 uh, years now from the nujs diploma in entrepreneurship administration and business law course we've had so many students say that you know they got shortlisted for interviews they got selected for interviews in a top law firm and like i'm saying from the evidence side of it that i have heard people say that and you know we even now we are always surprised that oh wow this kind of result happened this kind of result happened whatever we thought in our mind while actually conceptualizing the course uh, that is coming true and it has it is coming true in very new new ways and it reinforces that for us now how helpful are these these can actually make the big difference because you get your knowledge and skills in a very structured way now what you learn in an online course in say 3 months for you to learn it on your own without an online course people say everything is available online well that's not that's not really true and if it was true then you could have got the same knowledge in 3 months and that never happens if you try learning something on your own it will take maybe one and a half two years what you can learn in 3 months from an online course now you got to make the choice is that is it important to not pay the fees of an online course and spend 2 years learning it on your own in your 5th year you will not have that kind of uh, time or the risk to take with your career which is why 
and even at different times like you know if you can learn something in 3 months why don't you learn that and go move on in life because it's not that the level of knowledge required in the world will freeze at that 3 months level of knowledge you can go on and do bigger things maybe you will figure out that you can help people even now after you do an online course right away before you get a job maybe you can do that in your fourth year maybe you can do it in your third year so and it could be even earlier so these kind of opportunities keep springing up so for your success it definitely adds value if you take up an online course and in fact we have always been taking up you know training ourselves like the uh, me ramanuj we always encourage people we ourselves have been taking up different kinds of training and coaching to develop our own skills whether it is law related or non law related that depends de- based on our needs so for this definitely uh, online courses have uh, make a difference and you need to select the online course you choose very carefully like you can't just randomly say i like ip i want to make a career in ip so you go through five online courses find the cheapest one and take it no you can't do that do a little bit of diligence ask someone who's taken up the course on how they found it or read through some of the testimonials look at the syllabus see what are the services you get other than just materials online like how do you actually grow in your capacity to uh, as a professional like in the new jazz diploma course you are going to write 10 writing assignments so you're going to write 10 articles which can all be publishable online you will be undertaking a mock contract drafting exercises exercise so that will give you certain skills and a simulation of a contract drafting setup now that actually sets you up for something so so you need to look at what are the benefits what are the features of a specific online course and all online courses are definitely not the same there is huge variation in quality and price okay so you can't just go for price as the deciding factor you need to be able to identify what's a suitable online course for you and for your need all right abhita that was a uh, great information for everybody who is wanting to know what online course you are talking about i will put the link in the description below uh, abhita thank you so much for joining us this was very informational uh, i i'm sure you've helped a lot of us out here uh we really hope that you are on this show uh, again sometime soon to talk about different issues and we know for a fact that uh, you are an inspiration to many so uh, hoping for that and any closing thoughts thanks aditya i really enjoyed sharing this with everyone it was a lot of fun and i was happy to have been able to share something of value i hope uh, the viewers enjoyed this and yeah i would love to interact soon once again take care all right abhi there for yeah. every today yes getting into a law firm is difficult more difficult is to get through an hr's mail joining us tomorrow is avp legal of uh, legal lee consultancy who is handling uh, firms like karanja wala nayak nayak and company who would be talking about how to get through an hr uh, for getting into a law firm stay tuned and uh, definitely like share and subscribe don't forget to press the bell icon see you tomorrow on an hour with law seeko 8 to 9 i am aditya Until then, our law seeker. Have a great day, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Abhijit, for joining us. Yeah. Bye.